Good evening. Um, how are you? My name is Jelani Cobb. Um, if you're in the back, we would encourage you to kind of find your way uh, to your seat. We're about to start um, with the films. Um, my name is Jelani Cobb, and I'm the dean of the journalism school here. Uh, I am uh, very happy to be able to welcome you uh, here for this very important film. Um, I want to thank uh, everyone uh, at Frontline who made this uh, screening possible, uh, you know, particularly Rainey Aronson, who's in the, the back of the room, uh, who we've had the, I personally had the pleasure of working with um, on several films. And uh, you know, just the conversations around this film, uh, before I'd seen it, uh, really kind of emphasized the importance of it and highlighted to me um, the significance of the old cliche that, you know, as journalists, we hold a mirror uh, to society. Uh, and, you know, this film is really a distillation of that. Um, it's, as you'll see, sparse, um, almost spare in depicting uh, with kind of brutal realism you know, what exactly is happening in Ukraine. Um, and what specifically happened at this particular point in time in Mariupol. Uh, and so it really is uh, exemplary in terms of what it is that we're called to do and our highest responsibility uh, as journalists. Uh, I was talking to a reporter from The Spectator, uh, which is uh, for our visitors, uh, that is Columbia's student newspaper. I was talking to a reporter uh, from The Spectator this morning who wanted to know why it was important. He said, why is it important uh, that people are reporting uh, from war zones? Uh, and you know, he was talking about you know, the journalists who've died in Gaza and Israel. But, but why do people do this, was his question. And I said that war is the most grave of human undertakings. And if we take it seriously, this idea that journalists give information. Our job is to give people the information they need to make decisions about their lives. There is no more serious circumstance in which people need information than war. And so much so that we recognize the need of the world to be informed to be more important than our own lives. And uh, this film, I think, represents that kind of commitment. Uh, so I will um, say we will have a film, uh, Sunflower Field, um, which uh, will, Paulina Bucha, will, um, uh, her film, Sunflower Field, uh, will show as a five minute film, um, which will be followed uh, by 20 Days in Mariupol. There will not be anything in between, so you'll see the two films uh, in succession. Uh, and then following that, uh, our, my colleague uh, Azmat Khan uh, will come up and introduce the panel, um, which will be uh, Michelle Meisner, who is a producer uh, for this film, uh, Rennie Aronson, uh, June Cross, and uh, who am I leaving out? Oh, Paulina, Paulina also, <laughs> thank you. Um, so I'm sorry, Paulina, my apologies. Um, uh, so I think it's, uh, it's Venezia, is that, you know, my apologies in Russian? I shouldn't say Russian, that's not the language I want to use here. Um, so uh, that's it, and um, yeah, we'll begin with the screenings now. Thank you. Thank you all for being here tonight. My name is Asmat Khan, and I'm the director of the Simon and June Lee Center for Global Journalism here at the Journalism School, which along with the DART Center, for Journalism and Trauma, and the PBS series Frontline, are co-hosting tonight's event. In so many ways, 20 Days in Mariupol is a testament to the power that great conflict reporting that bears witness can have. Despite the risks, Associated Press journalists stayed in besieged Mariupol after Russia's invasion in the service of the truth, exposing atrocities, the bombings of hospitals, maternity wards, the shellings of homes, dwindling electricity and medicine, disinformation and efforts to discredit the truth. Across the world right now, 
the public is indebted to journalists who risk their lives in the service of that mission. Tonight, we're so fortunate to have many of those who helped make this film here with us in person tonight, and I'd like to introduce each of them. I'll start with Rainey Aronson Rath, the editor-in-chief and executive producer of the flagship PBS series Frontline. She oversees Frontline's acclaimed investigative reporting on air and online and directs the series' editorial vision, executive producing more than 20 documentary films each year. She's also a leading voice on transparency and the future of journalism. At a time when broad skepticism of the news media has reached new highs, she's cemented Frontline's reputation as a source of trustworthy and consistent investigative journalism. Frontline has won every major award in broadcast journalism. I would name them, but then you wouldn't, we wouldn't start this on time. It would take far too long, so let me just add this. As a 20-something researcher back in my Frontline days can attest, I can tell you that Rainey Aronson Rath is a, is a wonderful mentor to aspiring investigative journalists. Tonight, we also have Michelle Meisner, senior documentary editor and producer at Frontline. She was the producer and editor of this film, which is her first feature-length film. Meisner's work for Frontline has been recognized by the Peabody's, the World Press Photo, the DuPont Columbia Awards, and South by Southwest. Select titles as producer and editor include Life in Baghdad and Inside Yemen and The Last Call. In addition to films, Meisner has produced several acclaimed interactive documentaries, including Inheritance, The, Lost Gen the Last Generation, and Unresolved. We're also joined by Polina Buchak, an award-winning New York-based filmmaker. Born in Ukraine and raised in Nigeria, Buchak focuses on diverse and inclusive storytelling by blending new technologies into traditional mediums. Most recently, she directed the film that you watched before 20 Days in Mariupol, Sunflower Field, an animation exploring how the child's psyche is impacted during war. It won Best Short Animation at Woodstock Film Festival, as well as the Audience Award at the National Film Festival for Talented Youth. Buchak is an active volunteer for Razom for Ukraine, a New York City-based nonprofit creating content to raise funds for humanitarian aid for Ukraine, as well as leading their film programming. And lastly, we have June Cross. She's both a friendly professor and she is the Fred W. Friendly Professor, I shouldn't tell jokes, um, <laughs> of media and society um, here at the Journalism School and director of the Documentary Journalism Program, and she'll be moderating this evening. She's the winner of the DuPont Columbia Journalism Award, a National Emmy, and a 2021 Peabody Award. And her career has highlighted stories of the dispossessed and the intersection of race, politics, and public health. Please welcome our distinguished panelists. Thank you for being here. Um, war does not begin with an explosion, but with silence. Um, I wonder if we could go down the line and maybe start with you, Paulina, as our Ukrainian on this panel. Um, what does that line mean to you? Um, I'd like to, each of you to answer. What did that line mean to you within the context of this film? That first opening. On. Yeah, sorry, could you, could you repeat, give yeah. me the line one more time? <laughs> War doesn't start with an explosion, but with silence. Did I get that right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good job. Let's start with explosion. Um, I feel like I've, I've heard that line so many times at this point, but um, I, I'm gonna need the, uh, one second. Maybe it makes me think of, the other actually, it, I, it's very poignant from a story you told me earlier tonight, um, which I hope it's okay if I mention. Um, so in the days leading up to the full-scale invasion, you had a dream. Uh, yeah. Um, I expect in silence, in the silence of, you know, at some point. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, So I'll, I'll start, and uh, Mr. Slav Sharanov sends his regards. He wishes he could be t here with all of you tonight and is a really big admirer of your work, as we all are. I mean, I'm more than honored. I cannot, Mr. Slav cannot be replaced, obviously, but I'm more than honored to be here with you all. So um, it was interesting, the opening of the film, June, to your question. Mm -hmm. um, we kept asking Mr. Slav, how did he know 
that he should go to Mariupol, mm -hmm. right? And that, that was one of the animating questions of they went, they knew to go, and that's based on multiple years of him actually covering the war that preceded this. And he talked about the silence, and that's, every word that you hear is Mrs. Slav words, right? Those are his thoughts and his inner thoughts that Michelle brilliantly was able to edit, and that was really his meditation on war. And we all thought about that deeply. Mm -hmm. Michelle, can you talk about your editing process? Because this was, I don't know how many hundreds of hours of footage you must have had. But the writing is so spare, and yet the story tells itself. Um, uh, it's not wall-to-wall -wall narration, like some of our students <laughs> like to do. Um, the, the visuals actually tell the story, and his, um, his words really bring us emotionally more into the story. Can you talk about how you worked with them and worked through the footage? Sure, yeah. So thank you all for being here tonight, first of all. Um, I know it's a challenging film to watch, and um, the way that it's spoken about in the world is that it will be a difficult film to endure, and so it really means a lot to all of us, but particularly people like Mstislav and um, Evgeny Maloletka and Vasilisa Stepanenko, who are the filmmaker, the journalists on the ground with Mstislav as he gathered this footage. Um, so thank you for being here. Um, and to answer your question, so the number of hours of footage was actually quite small um, in comparison to other films, and you would know, having right. you know having made many, it, there were 40 hours of footage that he was able to get out of the city when he escaped, as you saw in the film, and they, um, and we had about a six-month edit, so and that's also fairly quick for a feature film, but we were really interested in getting something done quickly, but also giving it the time that it needed to help it be a, a document of history, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully. And um, so the process of working on it was, uh, Mstislav is a writer, actually, and that was an incredible discovery that we made, um, I or we had in the early days of working with him. And it's like, oh yes, and I wrote a novel. I'm a novelist. So in the, in the sense of having somebody who has a way with words, is a natural storyteller, um, thinks a lot about construction of stories and, um, and words. So he was somebody who was perfectly um, situated to write this story um, and also speak it. I don't know, I mean, you've heard him speak in this film, but also um, I don't, um, if you get an opportunity to go to something where he's speaking in a panel or a Q&A, I would encourage you to do it. He's a quite on the fly, natural, charismatic, you know, just like has a, um, is, is wonderful in that way. And so as we got to know him, as we were starting to log the footage and talk about the film, we would listen to him speak and think, we want him to tell this, like I hope he'll be willing to speak in the film and be the person that you can navigate this very difficult material alongside. Um, so that's how he became the voice in the film. He was very resistant to that initially. He did not want to make it about himself and as journalists, I'm sure you guys understand the dilemma in that, that you don't really don't want to make it focused on you, but at the same time, it uh, became a way that felt appropriate to tell this story in particular because he's from Ukraine, because he was invited into those uh, um, hospital rooms to keep filming and um, and then yes, he has a way with words. So, amazing way. Um, so you not a bad voice either. So. Yeah. Great voice. You constructed the film around both his efforts to get the story out, but also how his reporting fed the reporting of every other outlet in the world. Um, can you talk about your choice to do? I don't know if it was you or Rainey who came up with that. And yeah, I mean, actually, so first of all, this is a collaboration with the Associated Press. Yes. So one thing that was really important to them, this mm -hmm. is just stated to us as the people who are working with them at a senior level, was they really wanted people to understand what the AP does. And in fact, we learned that like 50% of the world sees AP stories every day. We didn't even know that, right? So we're filmmakers, but we were thinking of what is a what is the kind of conceit or the concept behind that and michelle and mrs Slav and myself too we talked a lot about the inside outside feeling of it so this idea that they were on the inside they didn't know 
the impact of their work even because they were cut off, right? But you see that tension and drama of him trying to find a signal. Mm -hmm. And again, to, Mi to Michelle's point, you know, it really becomes his story because of his efforts to get the word out. Mm -hmm. That's when I was convinced that he should be the voice of the film, mm -hmm. um, even though he was yet to be convinced, right? Mm -hmm. Is that he was the one with his two colleagues really trying to tell the story to all of us who were outside seeing things like the maternity ward moment, he worked so hard for us to see that, that it felt important to include that in the film. And the best way to do that is to show that. Mm -hmm. um, did AP come to you? Did you go to AP? How did this partnership come about? I, I went to the AP. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but um, Michelle and I have talked a lot about this, but I started to see footage coming out of Mariupol. And we didn't know who Mrs. Sharonov was at the time, but we definitely, I, I definitely saw there was a, a different compositional um, quality to his work, especially as Mariupol was going on. And we, we can talk about Mrs. Lav's ongoing process there and becoming a filmmaker in the field, but I called the AP, we work with them, and I just said, you know, if there is a film, if they get out, we would love to work with them on a documentary. We made for Sama. Um, and then I met Mrs. Slav, and he had just gotten out. He was in, I believe he was in Kharkiv at the time, and it was over Zoom, and he just said, oh my God, you know, I, I want to make a documentary, and I couldn't believe it because he was a news person to me in my mind, mm -hmm. but then he expressed, no, I wanted to make a film, and there's more, and so that was how it started. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, Michelle, she's the best collaborator I know and an amazing <laughs> editor. <laughs> So talk about that process of becoming, of a journalist becoming a documentary filmmaker. Well, I'll come back to you, yeah, I you, you come back your I, yeah. I get it, I was had an animation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Michelle mentioned that he's a novelist too, so he's a person who naturally thinks in long form, so you either have that ability, like that desire to tell longer form story. So if you're already thinking about narrative arcs and you're thinking about the seminal quality of a moment, like a moment they decided to stay. I think he was already starting to think like a documentarian. He just never had made a documentary. And so that's where Michelle came in, and really that collaboration was the key to that. You wanna talk about that, Michelle? Sure, I mean, it's a, um, it was a really unique experience. I mean, if you think about the context in which he was making this film. It was still happening. I mean, it is still happening. It was still within the first few months in, of the war. And so at the same time that we're talking about what he saw in Mariupol and how to construct a story with that footage, he was continuing to work in the field and going to places like Bucha and covering what had also happened there but actually hadn't been documented in quite the same way because no one was there to cover it in the same way that they were in Mariupol. And that was a really specific decision that he made mm -hmm. early on. Um, and that's the value of having journalists who are from the communities that are in the middle of the go. conflict. They know yeah. where to go. And so he knew that Mariupol would be the place where this would play out. And he wasn't the only one who knew. There were many journalists there at the beginning, mm -hmm. and they proceeded to leave. Right. And um, that team decided to stay. And that's why we have this footage. That's why we have this coverage of um, potential war crimes that will always exist. And, and I think that was also incredible about it is that we, he was dispatching these stories in real time, as you saw. So he is figuring out editing, cutting them, putting them, like, and if you can think about the 10 second. all of the things that you're thinking about in the field to just do your job. Yeah. And um, at the same time, he's trying to survive. And um, so he's doing that and putting them out into the world in real time. But And so then at that point, we knew, it also gave us a little time to think in the long form model, contextualize like what you do see in those news dispatches, mm -hmm. you know, um, that gave us, yeah, that gave us a chance to take a little time to think about how to construct the longer narrative, which he, you to your question about become like a, a journalist, becoming a documentarian. I think he th 
he has said, and I um, agree with it, that he thinks of films and documentaries as being sort of like the first book that, like one of like a book that's written about a historical event, that it has like staying power in a way, potentially that daily news won't necessarily get. And he does both. So he's speaking for, as somebody who does daily news and regular quick reporting and sees the value of that but then also has an interest in how do we tell the story of our time and how do I be a part of that? This is, sorry, just gonna add on. Some of the conversations that I've had with Mr. Slav was um, actually a question that I've asked him during one of our Q&As was how did you find a way to balance the, all the hats that you're wearing from A, being a journalist, and that comes with a certain you know, standards, rules, and then B, B, being a documentarian where you're a filmmaker, you wanna tell a compelling story that gets the audiences, you know, the arcs and everything. And then you Ukrainian who's watching his own home be burnt in flames. Um, and so I think like just, he does such a fantastic job here at balancing those sort of um, standards and where he's not really, his narration uh, invites you into, uh, sort of like when you're when you're I mean when you're facing terror you actually get to see how he's processing what he's seeing but at the same time he's not telling you how to think or who is the wrong guy he's just f placing facts as facts being a journalist um, and then obviously crafting with Michelle the whole arc of the story of the 20 days and I know that he wishes that he would have stayed longer than 20 days I think one of his the something that he talks about during his Q and A's consistently is the regret that the team couldn't capture what happened to the theater, because some of the people that you've well seen on screen, even the maternity hospital, they went into the hiding to the theater, and then it got leveled to the ground, um, and then there was nobody there to document that. So, you, you know, we only have those snippets, uh, but not the full story. So, um, he makes mention at the end of the film that he feels some sense of guilt and regret over leaving the story. Um, and one of the things I wonder about, I know we come up, we talk about a lot uh, within the school, uh, was sort of the, is the self-care involved in trying to do these kinds of stories and remain sane yourself. I can't imagine that being in the edit room and going through what the raw footage was, um, both of you, and I know your mom, are you a mom? Not yet? Okay. Um, mom? Single. <laughs> okay. I'm a mom, June. I'll I'm the mom. <laughs> You're the mom. Um, which is why we Love see moms. through, the, which we see through the frame of women and children so often in here. Um, and I lost the thought. Well, well I'll just mention one thing because mm -hmm. my, my boy is 17 and so he was 16 at the time. So I think each one of us, each moment will affect you differently. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing with Mstislav was um, he's talked a lot about this because this has been a question he's been asked, we've been asked, and he just says he finds solace in his work. And actually, I do too. And I think that is the thing is like if you feel your work is gonna have staying power, it's not that you don't also want to get help, right, at times, but if your work feels um, like it could have the impact of, of staying with people, of being a document, of being one of, in this case, the only document of what happened there, then that has, he talks about how helpful, mm -hmm. even though he has so much guilt about not staying longer. So the stories that have not been told, which inspires us all to keep telling stories. Yeah, I'll also say as an editor, and. I should probably distinguish for this crowd. It's um, like a video, ed like the film editor, hand like cutting the footage, not a news editor. Um, you're exposed to imagery of war if you work in a, uh, and you work consistently on films that are about really difficult subject matter. And um, you're exposed to people grieving, which are sometimes harder to watch than even the more uh, like visually disturbing films in and of themselves. Some of those, those like the graphic, very, very graphic footage that he filmed, um, rarely, he didn't point his camera at things that, like he wasn't thinking a lot about composition and what, how you were looking at something, but part of logging the footage, which you do starting the editing process, you watch all of those 40 hours all the way through and you're making notes and you could feel him composing the, th the shots to try to get it so that you were, you were understanding the 
devastation, but also in a way that had like care brought to it. And I will say the process of editing meant that I watched all of the hours, but also um, one thing that we have talked about at Frontline and also have had the opportunity to do, and I think you guys might have resources here too for, um, are through the DART Center for um, Trauma and Journalism. And, and this idea that you have people who are thinking actually right now about how journalists who are exposed to secondhand trauma are talking to people who are going through traumatic moments. There are tools and um, things that you can do. So if you're an editor, you can uh, set your screen to black and white. You can turn the sound down when you don't have to listen to the same sound over and over again. The crying. Um, my poor husband was like, I don't know what you're working on downstairs. Or, and he knew what I was working on, but he heard the cries. And so I, even for him, I was thinking about the um, offering that sort of like respect for his own exposure to it too, right? And so just being mindful of what you become, what you're exposing yourself to um, a lot. Can I just add one thing? The DART Center has been incredible with our filmmakers, our whole staff. We've now done like at least three or four sessions with them. So if you're working with really traumatic footage or you're going to places or you're really alarmed by the news, which why wouldn't you be if you're a human right now? They're incredible and they have done, I just have to say like as a person who runs Frontline, I'm so grateful to them because I, I we don't have that skill set to help our journalists and filmmakers and they literally have given us real tools to, to get through these moments in a little bit more healthy way. Pauline, are you still in touch with Mr. Sla I mean, have you been in touch recently with Mr. Slam? Yeah, at, every time friend? he's in New York City, I try to go and, uh, and catch him during his Q&As. How's he doing? Um, I mean, as soon as he's done doing Q&As, he's back home doing his job, reporting, and back to the front lines, which is I have, I don't know, it's, a <laughs> it's actually really funny because I think when I first met him at Sundance, and this is a story, little story that I said, it's just like I went to the premiere and I saw the Q&A, but then I met this man holding a cup of coffee and so uh, speaking with such a soft-spoken voice, and I couldn't put the two and two together that that was the man who was behind <laughs> something heart-wrenching as this story. Um, but that speaks to his character, as you know, after witnessing so much and, you know, having the difficult job and the difficult ter the territory that comes from being a war reporter. Um, but he is an inspiration to me and a lot of filmmakers like myself to, you know, keep going. We have, our war is not over. We're not in the headlines because apparently our air science is not clickbaity enough. But that happens, that's media, it's the cycles. Um, but, you know, that's why we have to keep going back. We have to keep telling the stories that are happening back home. I mean, it's just our job, we just can't stop. Which is also walking the fine line of like, how do you take care of yourself during this right. period? But the motivation is, is that until the day our victory comes, we just gotta keep going. Uh, since you raised the question of um, not being in the headlines anymore. It's impossible to watch this film and not think about what is going on in Gaza right now. Um, and I want, Rainy, do you have a crew on the ground in Gaza? Is there going to be? Oh. <laughs> well, um, I appreciate the question. I understand the question. And um, we do have three projects right now underway. Um, and I think the most important thing for Frontline right now we have a really big film that's going to come out in December, is context and nuance through this story. And um, we're all working day and night. We're really tired. We're really committed to it. So we actually have three films coming out in the next three months. And then we have a longer form project that um, is underway. It's very dangerous right now. As Asmat talked about, multiple journalists have been killed. And I she'll know the number, but it is... It is really horrifying what's happening to journalists. Thirty four as of two days 34 ago. Thirty four as I, I didn't check yeah. today. Um, so 40. we're very forty. We're really cognizant of safety first for our journalists. So we're working with the team right now. Um, they had to come out. And so that's also, you know, part of my job is safety protocol. And so yes, we will be covering all of this. 
just thinking where to go now that I have opened that door. <laughs> um, I think why? that it's just telling, it's, it's also. I was going to go ahead. You can tell I, what I'm going to say is why is it, these films are so grim to watch. Why is it so important for us to do these films? Uh, I mean, it's hard to watch people dying on screen and children dying and mothers crying and dying. Yeah. I think, um, and this is a, obviously a conversation I've had with the Ukrainian community. There's something about this, and, and this comes with any documentary that mm -hmm. documents such mm -hmm. full of terror uh, events, but um, because we were talking about how, uh, you know, f f at first we were seeing snippets, the five seconds, the 10 seconds, the picture from Malalietka, then it's like we get those, um, whatever we could get, the l little short stories, but behind them of what this documentary does, it just opens up the whole universe that that photo or those five seconds were part of. And I think what each, every Ukrainian went through while watching this documentary is that it's kind of was like re-exposure to that, to the first shock of seeing those photos of those five seconds. But in a way, it didn't deter us from coming again and gathering our community again. And like it, there's something about what you all also have experienced here emotionally because you saw something is super raw and super unfiltered. But the reason why we have to keep making documentaries like this is because frankly news reports do their job immediately to report on what's happening but we need to know that all those statistics that we see in the media behind each statistic is a human being is a human life mm -hmm. and we you know we need to uh, we need to know their arcs we need to know where they are now and that's why this type of work is incredibly important because mm -hmm. also documentarians are one of the best historians so in order for us, I mean, frankly, I'm pretty tired to say, like, learn to never again, but, you know, that's why you need stories like this to continue talking and so showing how the world is interconnected. It this, the, what the feelings that you feel out of watching the war that's happening in Ukraine, every single person who comes from a country that has ever faced war in Coughlin can feel those feelings, can feel the fear and the anger. Um, okay, I want to open the floor to questions. Um, as Dean Cobb often says, a question ends with a question mark. It usually has an inflection at the end of the statement. Uh, it is not a statement, it is a question. It is short. If you get up there and start making a statement, I'm going to cut you off. <laughs> so make sure you have a question and not a long platitude. Thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, I'm Kira. I'm a documentary student here. I wonder, as an editor, can you talk a little bit about the moment, how you chose to weave in the moment of the baby being born and waiting to hear its first cry? Because I think that was very impactful, and I would just love to hear about your creative process on that moment. So that was all Mstislav. As much of this is, he is a like somebody who was telling stories, I mean, the day he was born, I'm sure. But he, so he was, um, he told me about that, where did you go? Um, hi, okay, I was like, I was like, where'd she go? Um, no, it's okay, you can sit down. I just wanted to see where you were. Um, so I, I, yeah, he, that was one of the stories he told us um, as he was thinking about the scenes that he had gathered and he said, there's this, there's this birth that happens and we, I just kept filming and we didn't know what would happen and everybody in the room was just, their breath was being held and he said, I don't know if it comes through in the footage, but this is what happened. And sure enough, it, it does, especially after you've seen so much before it and you're anticipating the worst. And so then when there was that first cry, you identify with the relief of everybody else in the room. So that was his experience of it and so we cut it that way. Thank you so much for this uh, searing, heart-wrenching documentary. Uh, I ask your question, this question with a lot of pain. Uh, uh, throughout the documentary, we see uh, such a clear editorial line in all the news clips we watch and the documentary itself. 
um, that attacking civilians and hospitals are reprehensible war crimes, right? But right now, halfway across the world in Gaza, like Professor Cross mentioned, there are similar war crimes happening. Children killed, hospitals targeted. But the editorial conviction has been- Question, just please, the question. what's the question? The editorial conviction in the media has been missing. Why do the same publications, and I'm not speaking about PBS here, but across the media at large, why do the same publications who can condemn one with such moral clarity, one struggle with such moral clarity, struggle to condemn the other? Uh, and how can journalists do better? How can newsrooms do better? Are you talking, Are you talking specifically about, AP about, about the line? AP? Not about the AP, not about PBS, but in general, as editors, as, as veteran editors, oh. when you see newsrooms struggling to uh, condemn one the same way oh, they condemn got the you, other. Got you. Okay, so w I think the documentary that you just saw, you know, this is months after Mariupol. So just speaking for Frontline, like, please judge our work as it comes out and you can tell me how you feel. I think you're going to be um, reassured that it's fair. And you can look at our work on our website just to see a film called Shattered Dreams of Peace. Go and look at that film because it's it's two hours, but it'll give you a sense of the tone that we're going to be taking. Um, and as for the Associated Press, I can't speak for them, but I do know from talking to the editors that they're working very hard and they're publishing everything that they can every single day, every minute. So everyone on the journalism side is working very hard. I didn't mean the AP all. No, no, don't, and don't worry. I mean, it's I okay. understand this the question. This is like a third rail yeah. right now. We all understand. No, it's okay. And it's just very difficult to There's get no, cameras Yeah, in. but I think it's important to it's talk about. It's a very about, important question. You know, and yeah. I, th I think it's valid to talk about, and I think it's an important question to ask. So thank you. Hello, I'm Chloe. I'm one of the documentary students here, too. I really uh, enjoyed is a weird word to say for the film, but... Um, I really appreciated it, I guess is a good way to say it. So I was wondering, um, one of the parts of the film that I found really um, interesting and also important was um, including the part about how the Russian media outlets and the Russian governments were trying to claim that the scenes that we all saw um, from the AP were faked. So I wanted to know if you guys could go into more detail about how you chose to include it um, include that part of the story and um, if there's any parts you had to cut about that or, or if you wanted to add more um, yeah yeah so that's actually a good um, reason why Mrs. Slav was the person who ended up being tel telling the story as well is because they became part of the events that took place and they were so telling and um, the in fact as we were meeting him AP was to me at least, you knew where he was. I didn't know where he was. I was talking to him on Zoom in an dis undisclosed location somewhere because they were really concerned about his safety. Um, there, were journal there were journalists, as we all know, who were killed in Ukraine at the beginning of the war. Um, and also there was a filmmaker who was trying to get out of Mariupol around the same time that he left and he did not get out. Um, and so it, putting that detail and that impact of their work in the story um, felt like a way to demonstrate the power of the journalism that they were making and they were sharing um, and also a way that um, it was being yeah it was there it was being challenged but also the way that it was being they were being personally um, sought I mean, I just think one of the biggest things that we're all facing, I'm assuming some of you are journalists, is the information war right now, and who is actually telling the truth, right? And this runs through all of our work, and one thing I'll say about working with the AP is every single thing that you see, has, we have vetted together, there's no amplified bombs, like everything there is real, and to the big question about why does it matter that we do this work, we're not the government, we're the only people on the ground documenting things independently. And I just really think we need to keep showing how dis and misinformation is used. And we do this in a lot of frontline films, like A Thousand Cuts. And we keep doing this because we want to show how these information, literally, you know, information wars are, are defining our times. It's something that we all care so deeply about at Frontline. 
That's definitely something that Ukraine has been fighting with Russia for a long time. I mean, take, for example, the MH17 catastrophe and how that has been flipped and flopped uh, on Russian media. Um, and so, so like using all these snippets that they were, like AP was putting out, but they, Russia, ha we have to show what the Russian media is portraying because just to see how the propaganda machine is working to twist the stories and put the blame back on Ukrainians. And also just in pure storytelling terms, it raises the stakes for Mstislav to get this material where you placed it in the film, all of a sudden raises the stakes for him to get the material out. Um, I know this session was open to some of the film school students. Do I have any film people in here? Mm, discreet, okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I know Rainey has to leave, it is 8.30. Do you wanna say? Farewell. I think you're all wonderful to be here. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm so sorry I have to leave, but I have to take the last plane out of New York tonight. Mm -hmm. um, but thank you for coming and for being here and staying through the Q and A. And June, who is also a director for Frontline Two, knows me very well. So if you ever want to reach me, she can get to me. Okay. okay. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Good night. Good night. Okay, question. Hi, hi, yeah, hi, I'm Carla. I'm also a doc student, and uh, I'm very shaken up by this by this film. I guess that was the entire point. Um, and I, I realized because of this that images like this, we sort of, we tend to go numb to them if you see them a lot on the news, and it, it becomes more of, a, more of a thing that you kind of see and you don't really react very emotionally to anymore at some point. At least I feel like that's what's happening to a lot of people. So I'm wondering, especially as someone involved in the making of, of a project like this, how do you sort of, how do you, I don't know. And see, I don't even know how to ask my question now, but like, how do you decide what do we put in? How much graphic detail do we put in? I, I saw sometimes you blurred certain images. How do you sort of- How do you make those choices? Pardon? How do you make those choices? How do you make those choices? How do you know what might be too much for people to see when you see it every single hour of the day editing? I guess that's my question. Um, so, Mrs. Love had these conversations with the editors that he was working with in real time, um, and they, he was very insistent that he did not want war to be sanitized. And I think there are moments in the film where that's represented. He says, warning, graphic content, um, this is difficult, but it must be difficult to watch. Um, and I think that is something that we kept in mind as we were cutting. Um, but if also another thing that's interesting about the film, there's not, there, the very few blurs that are added um, are of what were in moments where it felt like there was, you know, there was like the kind of wound that just you would blur that, right? And that was with Arena, the pregnant woman who was taken out of the hospital after it was, um, and the maternity warm after, ward after it was bombed. Um, so a few instances like that we blur because that it crosses that line, but actually the film is so painful to me, more so when you're witnessing the grief and suffering of the parents. And that's actually something that you don't have the time in a regular news cycle to let play out and sit with. And there's no blurring that. That's just letting that, being witness to that. And so we made decisions with those ideas in mind, um, not wanting to over sanitize and um, wanting it to feel as um, respectful, but also as clear as we could. And that was, and that, I think it was also made a difference. I said this earlier, but he is somebody who could tell the story in a way that no one else could. I don't think I would have felt the same about editing it that way if it wasn't someone like him who was behind the camera, who was um, thinking deeply about the impact of what you were going to see and what he wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, yes, very similar question, actually. Um, linking back to that question of impact, is there, you know, it's very hard to watch, which could also mean that fewer people actually watch it. So is that a consideration that goes into this decision making? It, you know, it, you would think that people would, um, I was really afraid before the Sundance premiere um, because we did not know how people would react to this film. And 
as it turned out, it like every every screening was full. Um, the anticipation for the film was very high, and the reception of it was very warm, both with Ukrainians in the audience, who this was a very different story to witness. Um, there was, and also with Americans and the other people who were in the audience as well. Um, there were screenings where there was one screening where we didn't realize until we were doing a conversation like this after the film that someone stood up and told us that she is from Mariupol and her sister and family was there when this started. And they've actually really, in screenings like that and going forward, there's been a lot of community built around being like knowing that the story is being told. So reception within that world is they've embraced it. At the same time, it has been embraced, I think, by people who are not from that community because they're seeing war in a way that we don't usually see. Um, and while it's challenging, many people know going in that it will be. And it hasn't kept people from being interested in and attending. Um, so it, and it, it won an, the audience award at Sundance. So. Paulina, can you speak a little bit to yeah. the reception in the uh, Ukrainian community? Absolutely. I mean, uh, so my work through Razum, like I do, the, um, I joined with PBS teams to help them with the impact and reach uh, various communities from organizations like myself, like ours, which Ukrainian organizations uh, or activist leaders uh, throughout the US. And again, you would think that something as raw as this documentary would deter people away, but in fact, we've connected the uh, PBS team with like over 20 different organizations throughout the United States to just do local screenings there. Um, and not, and that's again, that's the Ukrainians, but they're also were all consistently urging them to bring their American friends and to come and watch this documentary. And the thing is, is like the, the theaters are consistently filled. I think um, maybe like even from my personal experience, like the reason why I want decided to watch this is because again, there's like familiarity of like I've seen these images before. I want to see what's the full story behind them, it, no matter how painful it is. And it's just that's the power of the documentary that just like keeps people coming back to it again. And in fact, I mean, every single Ukrainian comes out crying, but it's such a, <sighs> yeah, it's a, such a cathartic feeling because it's, it's, th it's the power of this documentary, you know? And it's like, frankly, and I told this to Mr. Sal, this is one of the films that's gonna go down in history because just like we said, it's like war has not been documented in such a way. Um, so yeah, I think it creates the buzz, but it's it's the curiosity aspect because you do get to see the story behind all those images. Um, we are technically out of time. I don't know, Kate, can I take two more questions or shall I wrap it? Okay. Mm. Hi, I wonder how did you handle the trauma of the of the victims? Like, I guess in when the war is happening, it's chaotic. In on like you have a balance of like want to like the world to see what's happening, but also like the trauma of the people. So like, did did he ask for permission for this trauma to be like exposed, or how does it work? Yeah. So when they were in the field, they were following the same practices that Associated Press journalists follow anytime they're covering conflict. Um, and those are pretty distinct. So um, things like wearing very clear press insignia, um, uh, not filming anybody who tells you not to film them, um, but also doing good journalism in the field and reporting on who is it that I filmed? What is their name? How do we, you know, like, and then what he did a lot of, um, as he was continuing to report on what was happening in the country in those initial months, they were also, Vasilisa was a big part of this, the other, um, the field producer on the project who was there with him the whole time, they were going back and finding the, like, where did everyone go? So they know where these families are. They are talking to the doctors and the nurses who are in the hospital. They, in fact, there's a, there's a, satellite um, hospital, a Mariupol hospital in Kyiv right now 
in the hopes that someday they'll be able to go back to Mariupol and start working from there again. Um, so in the interest of good journalism, they've gone to find these families. Um, and yeah, that's just a part of the work. Last question. Okay, last, last question. Hopefully this one's a good one to wrap up on as well. Um, you've talked a bit about the motivation um, of why everybody on this panel does this work. And you also talked about some real specifics about um, putting your screen in black and white or muting the sound. But when you're working on stories like this, how do you look after yourself? How do you know when to call it a day? How do you know when to take a break? How do you make this a sustainable career so that you can keep doing this kind of work going forward? It's, har it's hard. It's so hard. <laughs> my, my joking answer to this has always been the four scotch cure always worked for me. <laughs> but go ahead. Well, that is one way. It's not recommended, by the way. Um, <laughs> do love scotch. But um, so I have the privilege of having a therapist and access to health care that allows me to have one. Um, I wish everyone did. I wish it was a part of preventive, like, I wish it was part of preventative medicine. Um, I have uh, sought out resources. Um, I mentioned DART, but I understand your question. Like, beyond that, um, and it's hard. And I think it, just like the rest of life, like sometimes things feel like balance. I've heard people say balance isn't something that you seek necessarily every single day, but maybe if you can think of it like on scale, if you're working toward that, that might be a more realistic goal. Um, and so I don't beat myself up every day when it wasn't a balanced day. Like I didn't do all the things that I had plotted out and meant to do. Um, but that on, on scale, if I can figure out how to, how to do that. Does that make sense? Like, is that kind of getting Do you ever it? have those days where it's just too much and you have to walk away? Oh, yes. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And you have yeah. to. And you just let yourself do that? Yeah, for sure. And also being a part of a team helps that happen. And so on projects where, I mean, I'm working on something right now that's also really difficult. And I will say it's harder because um, it doesn't have someone like Mstislav behind it. We don't have a Mstislav on it. And um, just someone who has like the clarity of like, this is a story that I am situated to tell this way, you know? So, um, and when you're working with a topic that is um, difficult and the footage itself is difficult and, the wor and, you, and you find yourself, you're like, I'm thinking about story structure and this is like someone's life. Like it's just, a v you find yourself in those moments um, absolutely, I think you you find ways to step away from it, and I think on that. So to answer on that project, we te we put more. P I we have another editor on it because I just can't do it all. Um, so it's collaborations. It's looking for people you trust and people that you can work with and help each other. And one thing I'll say too that I have just noticed in the past few years, and I feel so grateful for, is the appreciation people have for our personal like personal lives like I really do f I sincerely feel that way like anytime someone on our team says I have a doctor's appointment everyone's like of course absolutely this deadline for this film I'm on right now got extended because um, we <laughs> frankly needed more time and I was like I booked a trip to see my brother smack in the middle of our finishing schedule and Rainey was like you are going we are not like you are not canceling that so there is a real sense right now and I hope it lasts I don't know what it's a consequence of it's not like that when I was no the and so the four scotch <laughs> rule was what was yeah. what happened but no right. this is this is something I really I truly do yeah. see this and if you don't see it it's in the places the you're working about having rainy at the don't stay there yeah. but again also like there's nothing wrong about stepping away and like uh, specifically speaking like with a non with the nonprofit work that we're doing where it's like from full scale invasion it's like go 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 consistently but you hit burnout and then if you if you're not helping yourself how can you help others and like don't get me wrong guilt is there guilt is there consistently when i'm not on like reading the news or whatnot but it's other than that like how can i be helpful if i don't take care of myself thank you so much thanks. thank you very much and thank, thank you, you both for staying. Thank all of you for staying.
And thank you all for coming, and I hope that you urge your friends and your communities to come up and see the screening, because as you have experience, it's like no other. And we're so lucky to have this film exist, so. And to have yours. Thank you for screening it tonight.